Hello, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'll introduce the notion of a category. A category is a formal mathematical gadget, and therefore consists of an interrelated collection of data satisfying certain properties. In the case of a category, one must specify three pieces of data and check two conditions. The first two pieces of data form what is conventionally referred to as a directed graph. The third piece of data is novel to categories, although in future lectures we'll see that is present in an interesting class of examples. I'll begin by presenting the general definition. I'll go through explicit examples in the next video, along with common interpretation of a category's constituents. Like any other mathematical concept, one shouldn't expect to get a concrete understanding of what a category is until one wrestles with a broad class of examples. But for now, just focus on the visual language accompanying the definition as it forms the basis for much of the intuition. The first piece of data in a category is a collection of objects. We'll depict these objects as dots. Someone in network theory might call these nodes. A geometrically minded person would say point. I'll use the word object. Think object of interest. I'll adopt a point set looking notation of x in C which is just shorthand for x as an object of c. The second piece of data is a collection of maps between pairs of objects. We'll represent these as arrows starting at one object called the source and ending at another object called the target. Someone in network theory might call these directed edges, a geometrically minded person would say a one-way path, and a category theorist would probably say morphism. I'll use the word map. Between any pair of objects, there is a set of maps, and I'll adopt the following notation. Shorthand for F is a map in C from X to Y. The third piece of data is novel to categories. It consists of a procedure for composing compatible ordered pairs of maps, thus obtaining a new map. Here, compatible means that the target of the first map, F, is the source of the second map, G. In other words, F begins where G ended. Their composite H must start where F began and end where G ended. Think F is first formed by doing F and then G. We'll draw this as a triangle whose interior is labeled by the equation F composed with G equals H. Dually, we could say that H factors as a composition of F and G. As the picture indicates, the source of H is the source of F, while the target of H is the target of G. Quick word of warning, for historical reasons, this composition is normally written as G circle F. Uh, in my opinion, the strengths of categories lie in its visual language, so I've decided to prioritize the compatibility between the written and the visual over being al aligned with historical tradition. In my opinion, this written notation doesn't scale very well. Eventually, our examples will become so complex that all the written notation will be in the back end, so to speak and mortals will be obligated to think in terms of this uh, diagrammatic language. Hopefully, this makes sense to those familiar with computational graphs. In some sense, category theory specializes to a more robust formalism to deal with structures normally conceptualized in terms of computational graphs. And that's it. If you want to construct a category, you have to specify three pieces of data, objects, maps between pairs of objects, and a procedure for composing compatible pairs of maps. This data must satisfy two properties, one existence and one uniqueness condition. The purpose of these conditions may seem opaque at first, but their role will become clearer as we progress. The first condition is an existence condition. It says that every object X has an associated map starting and ending at itself, called the identity map. This map is special in that composing with the identity does nothing. More precisely, given any map F into X, F composed with the identity map is just F. Similarly, for any map G, G composed with the identity is just G. Duly, one might say that every map factors through the source and target's identity. The second and final condition is about the uniqueness of composition. First, note that given any triplet of compatible maps, F, G, and H, there are two potentially distinct ways in which one can compose all of these maps. One way would be to first compose F and G and compose that composition with H. The other way would be to compose G and H and then compose F with that composition. A priori, these two maps could be potentially different. The associativity conditions ask that they be equal. And that's it. 
At this point, the only mystery is how these things are useful. In summary, if you want a category, you need to first specify three pieces of data, a collection of objects, maps between objects, and a procedure for composing pairs of compatible maps. Geometrically, we represent these as zero, one, and two-dimensional shapes. Once this is specified, you need to check two conditions. The first is that every object has an identity map starting and ending at set object, whose composition with another map returns the map you started with. Think six times one equals six equals one times six. Finally, you need to check that, given any string of compatible maps, it doesn't matter in what order you successively compose them. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, in the next video we'll get into the meat of things and write down some interesting examples. Before checking out the next video, I'd recommend trying to think of some structures from your own interests that feel like they can form categories, you know, whether they satisfy the above properties, and if they don't, see if you can modify your initial construction so that they do. Oh, and for those of you who enjoy pushing around formal symbols, I'd recommend proving that any two, quote, identity maps are equal. And thanks for tuning in. Uh, see you next time.